So let me introduce you to John Mike Gurney, who is a FreeBSD committer, and I've been working uh, lately on improving crypto stuff and uh, especially July performance on FreeBSD. Thank you, Olivier. So, uh, as he said, my name is John Mark Gurney. I've been a committer since 1997. I've been a user of FreeBSD since actually this year. Sometime this year will be my 20th year anniversary of using FreeBSD. So when Jordan put up this slide of installing FreeBSD from Floppy, I actually installed FreeBSD 1151 from 1.44 meg Floppy. So <laughs> I, I remember that quite fondly. So <laughs> as everybody, you know, the FreeBSD that we see today is dramatically different than the one that we had back then. Encryption, I mean, that was a new thing. SSH didn't even exist when back in 1151. It, it had net, we were still using Telnet and RSH, so it's awesome to see the progress that we've done. So, uh, what? Okay. So, um, J Jelly is a disk encryption layer for FreeBSD. It was created by PJD, who's somewhere around here. I'm not sure if he's here, but uh, you know, it, it did its thing. Um, it did its thing. I created, an, um, I put together a new server that I was using for home storage that consisted of eight disks, and when I, it was a whole new server replacing my old one, and. You know, why, why encrypt everything? One of the main, main, main advantages is with hard disk, if you want to RMA it, if the drive's dead, there's no way to destroy your data on it, you know. So not that helpful, you know. You have sensitive data, you know, whatever. Might be a, um, a uh, so, yeah. And so the original server, was using software crypto, and I was getting like 100, 150 megabytes per second on it. And then that was just too slow. Eight disks should perform much better. Yes, they're all SATA, but you know, each individual disk, 100 megabytes per second plus, you know, I should be getting a little bit better. Six core machine, that's a lot of cores, but still only 150 megs a second. So after some research, I, um, did not realize that my AMD Opteron had AS9 instructions. When I finally discovered it after a little bit of research, turned, um, loaded the AS9 module and the performance almost did not change. I was like, what? You know, I, um, the, my previous company, CRI, they worked on reviewing the AS9, AS9 instructions when Intel was creating them, so I knew for a fact that 100 megabytes per second on six cores is much too slow, and it's like, and 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 there were there are issues which I'll talk a little bit about more. But depending upon the cipher mode, you can have not so great performance. But with XTS, it should be significantly better. And obviously, if it's slow, people won't use it. I actually sometimes don't use SSH at home because, well, my servers can only get about 12, 15 megabytes per second on a gigabit LAN. So if I need to transfer files, I'll use NC, you know, because I can get 50, 70 megabytes per second. So, and then another goal, obviously, is maintainability. You know, this is no longer the 1990s where you spend five minutes on a project, you hack out some C code, and you just use it. So, as I mentioned, making sure you use the correct cipher mode is the most important thing. The interesting part, um, sadly, again, somebody's using the Linux Penguin. If you use a very bad encryption mode, this is what you can get. Yes, it is encrypted, but you can still see that it is clearly Tux the Penguin. But if you use a proper mode, it should look completely random. And then also sector size becomes a performance um, impact. Like if you use 4K sectors, you can actually get good, um, decent performance and the 4K limitation is the fact that that is a page size. If you use 512 sectors, you have to do a lot more overhead in the crypto because now you're doing eight times as many function calls. So um, like if you're doing performance per, um, measurements on G0, 
you're looking at like 300 megabytes a second versus 900 megabytes a second by going simply from 512 to 4K sectors. And then obviously key size, believe it or not, does not make that much of a difference, especially with ASNI. You are doing 14 rounds on the 256-bit key, but that's not much more than just um, than the 10 rounds in 128-bit. Um, so performance, as I mentioned, is very variable. And um, modes is another one. Um, Jelly supports AES-CBC mode. And as you can see, ECB de-encrypt is very slow. This is open SSL performance using ASNI instructions. And this is on my uh, 3.8 gigahertz AMD Opteron. And as you can see, the other modes like counter and XTS all get very good performance. And this is because both um, XTS and counter are able to be fully paralyzed. So cipher mode, as I mentioned, CBC. As, if, as you notice, if you have, uh, as you encrypt each block of plain text, you go through the block cipher operation, but then this cipher output goes to the next. And so there is no way that you can pipeline this. And so instead, with a mode like XTS, each plain text, each block cipher operation is completely independent. And this, ha um, this is the, um, the tweak, tweak factor, which is a Galois LFSR, which gets incremented. And this operation is, is very cheap if you know how to do it properly. And this one is the one that can consume many um, cycles and you have to do that. So, any, and feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or if you want to um, go into more detail. So, now the other mode that I mentioned is um, counter cipher mode, and that is again very easily to be paralyzed because of the fa near, mere fact that the, plain te um, the counter gets encrypted, which is just simply encrypted as you go along and then the plain text gets XORed with the cipher text. So again, the counter mode does not have that. And that, as we discussed, as you can see, they have very similar performance profiles on that. Oh, and the, I'll actually talk about the reason why EC, um, CBC decrypt is actually able to be performed um, in a very much faster than encrypt is, because as you can see, in order to decrypt, you can do all these decrypt operations in parallel, and then after you've done the decrypt, you do the XOR for the ciphertext. So the inverse is fully parallelizable, but not the encrypt. So reading data is fast, but not writing. So, oopsies, I went through. So as I mentioned, one of the big things is that with AES, if, um, if you don't have the instructions um, pipelining, let's see here. AES has uh, 10, 12, or 14 rounds, depending upon key size. And um, each round depends upon the previous one. There's, uh, um, there's a whole sort of set of operations that you do for each round. There's a sub-bytes round. There's a, um, a substitute, um, rotate rows, um, rotate co um, mix columns, and then, a, um, and then that's for those. And so the thing is, is that if you do the, um, the original ASNI code was doing only one AES block at a time. And so you ended up with this simple thing. So like it, after three instructions, this is a, each one of these is seven cycles. So after uh, three rounds, it would take 21 clock cycles. But the ASNI instructions are able to be fully um, pipelined, meaning that um, as it, depending upon other factors, even though the instruction may take seven clock cycles to complete before you can get the results and use it, you can actually schedule another one immediately on the next clock cycle. So obviously, if you're doing you know, one after another, that's not very good. But as, as you see in this, when we do three separate instructions each time we schedule a new clock cycle, we can actually get another thing. And so with this, we've now done three blocks in merely two more clock cycles than we did a one, one block. Um, the ASNI implementation that I did actually does eight blocks at a time. There's, it's kind of, 
Processor optimization is always very tricky. Sometimes it's better to do only four blocks in parallel, but I tried to do this target for all Intel and AMD processors, and some of the older Intel processors have less than ideal um, latencies and throughputs, and so doing eight seemed about the best ideal to get the best performance, and you know, every processor, you change something and things. So the other thing is, is that um, I measured performance was, as I mentioned, there's a tweak factor in XTS, and this tweak factor is necessary in order to ensure that the data remains confidential. If the, if the tweak factor was not there, then you would actually end up the problem with, similar to the ECB attack, where if you wrote one set of block of data and then you rewrote the next one, you could actually if you knew the plain text and you knew the cipher and you could observe the cipher text, you could actually XOR the two cipher texts and you would actually be able to see the difference between the plain text. So, um, sorry, I, if you only know the cipher text and you were a, you'd able to be able to get the XOR difference between the two. And so, obviously, if you're writing data to your hard disk, confidentiality is necessary. So, the tweak factor also. Um, um, takes a little bit of work. The original code, um, I forget how long ago, did the tweak factor in a very inefficient manner. It did it each byte, and the tweak, tweak factor is 16 bytes long, and every, um, for every, um, every byte, it would actually have to do, uh, it'd have to do a branch to test to whether there was a carry or not between the two things. So we now have a 16 iteration loop with a branch and even with modern branch predicting processors that will never be predicted right. So your performance will be very less than ideal. And so if the high bit was actually necessary, then we add the, um, re we add the reduction step. I'm not gonna get into Gawa field math. It's not that interesting. So then PJD did some improvements because that, believe it or not, was actually a significant performance problem. And he improved it up to 64 bits in width. And this obviously is much better. Now we have, you know, pull out the carry. Now we only have one if statement instead of 16 if statements on each iteration and add in the appropriate tweak factor. So it turns out that even, um, I work, um, at CRI, I worked with a, um, a friend of mine called Mike Hamburg, and he does elliptic curve cryptography and does other really low-level stuff. And it turns out that I was talking to him about various performance improvements, and he, he actually came up with a way to do the tweak factor in five SSE instructions with no branches. Branch, as I mentioned earlier, if you branch, in a processor, you have to throw lots of state away. So avoiding branches can make huge performance gains. Even if it seems that you have to do more work, the pipeline will still be filled and you'll get better performance. So in order to do, um, but the tricky part is, is that in SSE, there, SSE, all of those instructions are designed to break up a large register into small sections like 32-bit words, 64-bit words, you know, four 32-bit floating points or two 64-bit floating point numbers, but they are not actually designed to operate as a 128-bit number. You'd think there would have some of that, but it turns out that they don't. So th simple things like, you know, a shift, uh, shift left by one bit you actually end up shifting 30, uh, four 32-bit words one bit to the left, but then you lose all those high bits. So the question is, is how do you actually implement some of these functions? And so with a little bit of magic, you can do that. There's, uh, we put in a, um, a constant together. I have a, a, the next slide will have a nice little diagram on this. We shuffle some things together. We shift right arithmetic by 31 bits, which actually spreads everything over. Um, add in the alpha mask, and then we shift left by one, and then we return. So this is a diagram of actually what is happening. So we have the inputs, and th these are the four different 32-bit words. We shuffle them around, which is the equivalent of a left barrel shift 
by um, one 32-bit word. Then, as you see, the right shift arithmetic smears the high bit down so that all 32-bit <sighs> registers contain it. So this will either be a zero or one, depending upon whether the high bit is one. And then when we add in the mask, we will now have the equivalent uh, high bit set. So now this high bit magically gets transported to here. And if the high bit needed to um, do the reduction step because this high bit was one, we now add in the appropriate alpha mask to be reduced. And then now we do the shift left by one, and which vacates all of these places. And then we XOR in the combination. And since we know this will be zero, this will, this will make the shift come out perfectly fine. So the other step that I decided was, uh, you know, there's almost everybody's done low level, um, or uh, there's been lots of implementations of using AES, using low level assembly. But the problem is, is who wants to maintain assembly code? Raise their hand. <laughs> Nobody raised hands. I mean, we're getting to the point where even when you're doing supporting to an ARM board, it's like, okay, I'll do the minimum amount of work in assembly to the point where I can call in and have a proper C stack, and then I'm doing all the rest of the work in C because, you know, assembly is just annoying to work with. So, and it's, you know, C is almost low level enough. So there's some, um, I decided to go with intrinsics for this project. And, um, there's well-established intrinsics that are cross-platform, even between Windows and um, Linux and FreeBSD, that allow you to get access to all of these intrinsics. And there's some good advantages to using intrinsics. Some of it is works around their ABI limitation. On AMD64, the number of XMM registers that you can pass in to uh, um, into a function is eight, which is a good amount of registers. But the problem is, is that when you return from the function, you can only pass back two XMM registers. Now, if you're doing a function that will do eight blocks of encryption, you would like to pass in eight registers, which is the eight blocks of the data that you're encrypting. And then you'd like to pass back those eight, eight, um, eight blocks of data in the registers too, as opposed to spilling to the stack. Even though modern processors are very, very good at optimizing away um, stack reads and writes, you know, even the L1 cache is still slower than the registers. So being able to work around that, you know, and this, if you can inline functions, you can get some decent performance improvements and other stuff. The other interesting thing, we now have a single source of the ASXDS XTS implementation that works both between i386 and AMD64, which means anybody who does performance improvements on AMD64, i386 gets them for free. If we had been doing this with assembly, since all the lo local 32, 64-bit registers don't match, you'd have to rewrite, port it to two different, um, to both i386 and AMD64. Admittedly, not many people are going to be running ASNI on i386, but there might be some people who do it. And as we demonstrated, nobody wants to write assembly. So maintainable, maintainability is nice. Obviously, assembly, when you know your processor architecture, you can make sure all the instructions get scheduled in the right order. Um, modern pro um, compilers are getting better at this, but they do not have the perfect idea of when should I run various instructions. You know, they don't know that, oh, if I run this multiply, uh, um, schedule, put this multiply a few instructions earlier, the data will be ready um, early enough. And yes, processors have look ahead buffers in order to do out of order execution, but that's not a cure all for everything. And so. There's some advantages there. Um, assembly, since you're writing everything, it's much easier to do non-aligned loads. Yes, even though x86 is a non, um, in most loads do not require alignment, SSC has both versions that do handle aligned, um, um, require alignment, and will fault if it's not, and also unaligned um, um, memory loads. Now. I've done some research and pretty much af within one generation, all the processors had performance where 
unaligned and aligned were exactly the same performance. There was no um, disadvantage, except for obviously with unaligned, you might cross a um, cache line. But otherwise, the performance is almost the same. So it's almost why don't the compilers just use the unaligned instruction by default? But they don't. The other issue was the original port, bin utils using the AS assembler for GCC did not support AS9 intrinsics. Clang did, but when I did the work, FreeBSD was still trying to support GCC on both i386 and AMD64. And we are old bin utils from many, many years ago in GCC did not have AES and I instruction support. Um, support. And so one of, part of the project was actually um, adding that to GCC. Luckily, other people had done it, so I found their patches with a little bit of work managed to do it. So not too bad. So, and um, actually, when I last gave this presentation, uh, David Chisnell mentioned that with in inline assembly, you can actually create your own calling convention. So you could actually work around the ABI limitations and still do the uh, assembly version, but then you still now have to maintain the assembly source code. Adding ASNI to the tool chain, as I mentioned, Clang did not real, um, need any work. GCC, which luckily, hopefully will go away soon, but is really, really ancient. We're based on 421. I heard that the 48 GCC branch is frozen, and I think the current development is five. So just to give you an example of <laughs> how old our bin util GCC bin utils. I don't remember the exact version of our bin utils, but it's not much newer than 42 if it is that much newer. And so it turns out that um, we, uh, in order, the, um, we needed to add the AS and I instructions to bin utils in order to do inline assembly in that. We also needed, GCC needed the new headers in order to provide the additional intrinsics. Luckily, it turns out Clang's headers, I used one of those headers um, without any troubles and then I created the other one. Another instruction that came along with uh, the ASNI was an instruction called PCL mole QDQ. And, or, actually, actually I must have that wrong on my slide because I'm pretty sure it's QDQ, not DQD. So I'll have to take a look at that. Um, this, what um, I added that at the time I was doing this work, XTS does not use this instruction. I'm actually work, right now working on a, a near completion of a, a FreeBSD Foundation sponsored project to add AESGCM to the crypto, um, to the open crypto framework. And that ends up using the PCL mole QDQ instruction because that, um, does a Galois field multiply in for XTS? We only needed to do what is the equivalent of what is a, called a increment, so to say, a multiply by two, and that is much easier. But this one does a full 64-bit multiply, and so that actually ended up being useful for that. So the original assembly that um, came with the AS and I done way way long ago looked like this, and this was a simple ECB encrypt, no pipelining, and that was actually the other issue was the original assembly had absolutely no pipelining done, and so my big, big performance increase was simply being able to do eight blocks at a time. Now, if you might notice, this AS inc instruction is com commented out. That is because we did not support assembling that instruction. And so some, uh, the author basically hand assembled it and put in the raw bytecodes in order to emulate that. <laughs> you think this is maintainable? No. <laughs> and obviously, well, if our GCC util bin utils didn't support assembling it, well, and you want the new feature, are you gonna spend the time to update GCC? Or make this, you know, you only have to do it in a few places, so. The intrinsics provides in C a native 128-bit data type. There's other things. The M128I is for integers. There's also one for like single, um, single precision floating point and also a double um, precision floating point. 
Um, you can choose, uh, the intrinsics can be implemented either as an inline assembly function or um, a built-in. The built-in actually, implementing it as a built-in, there are some advantages. I ran in, when I was doing some of my testing, I ran into issues where if you passed in a constant that was inline, that was passed through like two or three different functions, even though the outer line was constant, the optimizer could not actually detect through the different function calls that this was a constant and um, some of the instructions required a constant to be passed in line to the inline assembly, otherwise it would fail. And so when it was doing the optimization, it would say, sorry, I can't compile this because it's not a constant, even though it actually was a constant. So, but with the built-in, it turns out that there was, I did not actually implement any built-ins, partly because, well, GCC is dying, and at least for FreeBSD, and so didn't want to do as much work. So there are a few cases where an intrinsic will not work with the existing GCC, but it will work on other cases. Um, the features that we added must be enabled via feature flags. So, you know, if you do a standard CC, um, it will not include support for like SSE or the MMX instructions. And so that we added additional MAS and MPCL mole um, compiler flags in order to support the additional features. And as I mentioned, supporting unaligned access was not very um, easy to do in the C code. There's one where you could do the explicit load U, U for unassigned. There's also a load A, I believe, if I remember correctly, for loading a line, but well, you might as well just do a pointer DREF and you get the unaligned load. The other option that I um, got, I forget exactly where I found it, was packed structures tell the compiler that all, since all the members in the structure could be at any location and you know, like if you follow a char by an integer, that integer will be unaligned. It actually isn't smart enough to figure out that it assumes that the entire structure is unaligned even though it contains all properly aligned data structures. And so the compiler will properly emit um, proper unaligned accesses when accessing through a packed structure. When you, you're trying to access eight um, 128 bit registers, it's much easier to use memory D references as opposed to having to call load U eight times. So, this is the intrinsic code for a simple um, AES encrypt round. How many people think this is much better to read than the AES assembly earlier? <laughs> Well, yes, it is still hard to read because this is pretty low-level stuff, but now you can actually very easily see the fact that we XOR in the key schedule. We do the um, 10, 12, or 14 rounds, and then we just do the end class because the last round of AS is special, and we do that, and we're done. So, you know, this is much easier to work with. So, now the next thing is, is now that we've had we have, and when I did all, almost all of my testing, this testing I did was pretty much all done in user land because I don't have to reboot kernels or reload modules or if I accidentally get a pointer wrong, I dereference random memory data and crash my machine. I did all of the development work in user land, which was very convenient to do. But the next thing is, is well, it's not very useful in user land if we're gonna be using it with uh, for the online thing. So now we need to add it to the kernel, kernel compile. The trickiness here is, is that all the, um, our FreeBSD's kernel, when it is compiled, they disable all the standard includes because we do not want like standard IO to be polluting the kernel compile. The kernel has a completely different interface. It implements its own like, you know, printf functions. They're like, you know, F open doesn't exist in the kernel. So all of those, you, we don't want to pull in those header files. And so, but except the problem is, is that the AS9 intrinsic header files are only in user land. They are not actually in the kernel. So I have to remove the no standard ink flag, which is normally passed, turn on um, increased optimization, because in my testing, O2, um, O3 gave better performance than O2, 
The interesting thing is some other code that I was working on around the same time, O2 actually gave better performance than O3, and that gets into some really deep, dark compiler magic. And then obviously we have to turn on the AES instructions and the appropriate MMX and SSC. So in my performance test, um, has in, whom, how many people here have used Ministat? Those who haven't used Ministat, it is an extremely useful tool that PHK wrote a number of years ago. The problem is, is when you're benchmarking stuff, if you run it once and you run it again, computers do not always, even though they execute the exact same thing, interrupts and other stuff, will change the performance and you will not get exactly the same uh, runtime for every time you run instructions. The pr and the problem is, is that in some cases, the variability may be high, high enough and the performance may only be a few percent difference that you cannot actually clearly tell which performed better. Ministat lets you run statistical analysis on your benchmark data to actually give you confident results that yes, the change that I'd made did make a difference. Now admittedly, there are some cases where recompiling the kernel when you add new code will shift things around so that your change may not actually have been the responsible change and changing around instruction layout can actually improve it. But you know, with a little bit of other work, you can actually figure this out. So in this case, the original software performance, and if I remember correctly, this was in megabytes per second or bytes per second. The original software was not very good. Then I added the AS and I. And an, it is very interesting when you are working on performing and increasing performance of software, you really need to understand all of the systems that you interact with. One of the, um, um, when I was doing performance um, measurements and stuff, I used some tools to actually visualize this. And one of the things that I found out was that I had a random thread that was doing um, some, some work and it didn't make sense. And it turns out, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, enabling one little flag that basically said, this is a synchronous, um, 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 a synchronous call not to use the thread, gave me a nice little boost of performance. And as you can see, you know, I almost doubled, or doubled performance in this case. So the thing is, is benchmark, getting standard timing benchmarks or bytes per second, that's pretty easy. But the question is, is now, when you're, this, that assumes you already know what you want to improve performance. The next question is, is how do you even identify what you need to do, um, pr um, provide for performance? Turns out that FreeBSD has um, a couple of very useful tools in order to improve performance. One of the first ones is PMC stat. This, um, I don't remember how long they've been around. It's actually, I think, well over 10 years. But um, modern Intel processors and even other architecture processors have what are called uh, um, performance monitoring counters in the silicon. And you can enable them, and you can actually count things like L1 cache misses, L2 cache misses, um, instruction pipeline stalls, how many micro ops were executed, the instructions that were executed. There are, there's a huge, huge host of um, instructions. And, if you, and the nice thing is, is that if you load the um, HWPMC module, this, all of these um, functions are available to user land as a normal user. You don't have to be root. You can run PMC stat to gather your stats as a normal user as long as you've already loaded the HWPMC module, which is very convenient. And in this case, we basically say how many times, um, measure all the, all the times that the CPU clock is unhalted and, out, and run my test. Perform, um, my test. Turns out that PMC stat um, is a general utility, and um, their pre pre preceding PMC was uh, GProf. Has anybody used GProf? That's pretty good. Problem is, is if you enable GProf, your performance goes to crap. 
every single function gets annotated with an M count and stores all this data. And so now instant, instantly, every function call you make now already takes 100 clock cycles. So if you had a type function that was taking 10 clock cycles, now it's 10 times worse, you know. And it just gets not very manageable. Your program runs five times slower. The beauty with PMC, since it's hardware, it collects all the registers, every once in a while interrupts to dump the data, your pr program runs pretty much at native speed. I don't, you cannot tell the slowdown on that. The only issue is, is that um, GProf is one of the data output formats. Turns out GProf is a program, a relic of the 1990s. It, the counters are only 16 bits in size. So if you run anything for very long or very large, you will overflow 64K. Turns out that a call tree format does not have this um, problem, and call tree is used by Kcash, Kcash Grind to, figure, um, to be able to handle that. So in my performance, I had various um, functions that were well over 100,000. I forget the exact number. So um, has anybody used Kcash Grind? Wow, actually, there's a good number of people who have used it. It One of the nice little um, graphs that it pr um, prints out that you can do is this. And if you're actually running the application, you can mouse over this and all this big area is where you want to um, optimize. Obviously, it's kind of hard to optimize the idle CPU, but this you can actually see the, um, the a majority of my work is done in AES Enc 8, which is the eight block encrypt. And considering that we're doing, that's the most innermost loop, that's a good thing to see. You can't optimize that anymore. But the thing is, is that you can optimize all the call, parent calls around it. And as you can see, there's actually a lot of area that you can optimize. And I, I know I, I have a bigger version, but oh, see, this one, I'm not sure what happened, but this is the cranking the LFSR. And you can, that actually ends up using about 2.68%. And if it's already, and I think this was on my optimized version, if even if on the optimized version it was using 2.68%, you can imagine how big this was back on the byte access one. And so I was poking around, seeing what was going on and other stuff, and I think this is the thread that I did, but with a little bit of poking around, I found out that there was this th random thread that I wasn't expecting called crypto ret proc that was consuming approximately 15% of the CPU. And upon further investigation, that was the whole sync um, flag that I was talking about. This was one of the first real non-algorithmic changes that I made. And by simply adding, it was a one-line diff that was when I was registering ASNI driver in with the Open Crypto Framework, if I said, hey, you know, Call me, um, I don't need to schedule in a separate thread. If you just do a sync call, perform, I got a 27% perform, percent performance increase simply by adding that. That was one of the most happy patches that I committed. You know, it's kind of hard not to <laughs> add, you know, what, what is it, however many characters that is, plus the pipe to in, get, get a nice, almost a third percent per performance. So, the other utility that you can use to measure performance in FreeBSD is Dtrace. Dtrace goes, um, uh, uh, Dtrace, how many people have heard of Dtrace? So, how many people have used Dtrace? It, it's very, very, very useful utility. Actually, in another, um, uh, in another project on, on a PCIe driver I was writing, I actually discovered an interrupt storm that was only possible to discover with printf. The code worked perfectly fine with or without, um, with the printfs and without the printfs, it worked perfectly fine, but there was an interrupt that was firing repeatedly that I wasn't shutting down, but I could not tell that. But with Dtrace, the overhead was so little that I was actually able to see an interrupt storm and it go away. And so Dtrace is a very beautiful thing. The other useful thing is, is that um, Dtrace, you can um, pull full stacks. So this is what is called a flame graph. If you do a Google for a flame graph, 
the readme on generating a flame graph works exactly as is in the readme, just as long as you have loaded the, the dtrace. So the, in the case of the dtrace, you basically set up a profiling hertz like every thousand times a second, it will basically sample what the kernel stack is. And so this is a standard way to do a statistical performance monitoring and figure out exactly what it is. And so this is really just kind of like a one or two dimensional version of the exact, pretty much the exact same graph that we saw here. But it's pretty to um, look at and gives you the exact same information because as you can see, there's the, I think that's the AS Inc. 8 and then you can also see these other st um, other um, other pits of work. And so this is actually the um, system calls, user land side of things. This is all the crypto. I actually removed the idle thread on this just because the idle thread was like over half the graph. And that, you know, the data that I care about is this data. So in this case, um, there's also the geom zero thread, which is kind of like dev zero, but for disk devices, which gives, um, is much lighter weight than the, um, using like a dev MD. And so turn off witness if you're running head so that you don't have that. The other thing that when I was working on Jelly, Jelly doing original software crypto, you want to use as many cores as possible. So. Um, Jelly, by default, will actually find out how many cores your machine has and launch that number of threads in order to handle it. That way, when um, if you, it receives a 128 kilobyte read request, it will split that 128 kilobit read request into eight kilo, um, the four kilobyte sectors, so it'll generate 32 requests and ship them off. That means that you know all six, eight, 24 cores, or however many your processor has, can do some of the work and then it'll re-aggregate all the work together. The thing is, is that as I originally stated on the, um, I was using this on an eight disk subsystem with six cores. So that, and then, oh, my root is also Jelly encrypted. My Zill is also Jelly encrypted. My L2 arc is also um, encrypted. And my swap partition is also encrypted. So if I, I think I had like 15 Jelly volumes on the system. And if they all fired off six cores, you're looking at like around 100 threads that, you know, and the thing, think about that. Even just when I accessed, did a read or a write to the eight disk ZFS raid, you know, eight times six threads would suddenly, you have this thundering herd problems of all of these threads wanting to do work. So I actually got significant performance by just restricting it to one. Obviously, totally depends upon your workload. And so current performance right now is around 900 megabytes per second. Oh, and the other option is, is that you can tell Jelly not to actually zero the data just to get that little bit of performance. And so we're getting around 900 megabytes per second on my 3.4 gigahertz AMD processor that will turbo boost up to four gigahertz. There are some continued improvements. The um, uh, only calls through the open crypto framework are improved. There's a direct Rindal calls that um, a few parts of the kernel use that will not receive performance. Part of this is, is that in the kernel, the um, SSE instructions use the FPU. FreeBSD kernel by default does not actually save the FPU registers because right now with um, SSE instructions, the entire FPU save state is about a kilobyte. And with the upcoming AVX2 instructions, that will increase to two kilobytes. So having to save two kilobytes of data in addition to all the registers on every context switch would become very, very expensive. And so the kernel by default does not allow you to use FPU, which is part of the reason why there's a special AES and I driver in order to do the work. And so with that, um, so yeah, that's, um, and, and, the, and the problem is, is that the direct software implementation sometimes is called in a place where other locks are held, and so you cannot actually allocate memory to, um, to have the FPU save state uh, in, in non-sleepable context. So there's some work that I'd like to get done on that. Partly also, SSC 256 
um, there's an improved algorithm using SSE registers to improve um, SHA-256 using the SSE. Um, there's uh, ju just actually about a month ago, a uh, commit was made to increase our memory pool such that large allocations up to 64K are um, now cached as opposed to up to 4K. This actually improves things um, a little bit because Jelly makes, some of the times it makes very large memory allocations to the tune of 128K or greater. The problem is, is that um, FreeBSD, whenever you do a large memory allocation, it actually has to do, send out a notification to all the other cores to invalidate the page tables for that range so that that way, if you're, um, that new, as soon as you use that new allocation, if your thread gets scheduled for another processor, that it actually has the proper virtual memory. Um, the other option is, is since AES XTS uses two different um, keys, you could um, pipeline the key schedule, but since it get, gets done so rarely, the performance would not actually be improved. And as I mentioned, the AES GCM work is um, coming along. Some of it's being reviewed right now. And then also I mentioned the SHA-256 for ZFS. And as I talked with PJD at the um, Dev Summit, and there are lots of other improvements to the Open Crypto Framework that I'd like to make. So. So, does anybody have any questions for me? So, oh, um, microphone, I, or. I just wanted to ask, uh, when you told about uh, how many rounds of IS XTS you make, mm -hmm. uh, are there, in effect, N plus one round, yes? Because the last one doesn't count as N. So the, no, actually, so the um, AES Inc. last, let's see here, let me go, you're talking about like this code, right? Uh, yes. So um, the, it's, uh, I'm try trying to, re it's been a while since I remember that. It's really confusing because the, let's see here, the key schedule is one. There's a, so like in a 10 round, you have 12 of these. So I thought um, I'd have to take a look at the Wikipedia to r remind myself, but um, I think that e that ink last is actually the 10th round, if I remember correctly. And so like the nine is normal and then the 10th is an extra. It's not like 10 normal and then 11th, so, but. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you.